I'm also hoping that too, hoping and believing. Good morning, everybody. Um, recently, I was in Switzerland doing some meetings with the, with the pastors there, and uh, the conference president said, well, in a couple years, you'll just be able to stand up in your home and your hologram will appear here in front of us and we won't be able to tell the difference unless we walk up and put our hand through you. So technology is definitely advancing, that's for sure. Uh, thank you for that beautiful music. I mean, what's happening when, when we encounter that kind of beauty, melodic beauty? What is that? What is that? A long time ago, there, there was, uh, like 500 years before Christ, an ancient group of Greek hippies. And they had musical instruments, and they traveled all around, and they did two things. They were observers of nature, so they were scientists. They were just paying attention to what's going on around them in the world. And they were also storytellers in the form of song. They were bards. And so they would sing songs for the people, then they would gather the people around closer, and then they would talk about what they're observing in the universe. And that ancient group of Greek hippies noticed two things. They noticed that the world around them is just math, 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 and more math. It's all geometric. It's math. But they were also musicians, they were artists. And they noticed that music is math. Now, those who are not classically trained don't know that. People who play by ear, they just, you know, they're just doing it, right? But those who read music and those who are classically trained, they know that they're actually performing a mathematical kind of art, right? It's math. And so, they put the two together. They said the universe is math, and music is math. And they said, well, God must have sung the universe into existence. And that's where we get the term that you may have heard, the music of the spheres. We got that from the ancient Greeks, uh, which re recently put you know, in an album by Coldplay. But anyways, the point is that the music of the spheres, right? It's met. So I have a definition of music, what we just witnessed, what we just experienced. Here's, here's my definition of music. I wish this would get in the dictionary because I think this is pretty accurate. Music is emotionally rendered math. That's what it is. It's emotionally rendered math, and that's why when you feel troubled or depressed or anxious or just weirded out about anything in life, a lot of us, a high percentage of us, we run to music for order. We don't think about it that way, but when you listen to beautiful music, it realigns, it reorders, it mathematically calibrates your emotions. You've experienced that, no doubt. And that's what we just witnessed and heard with our ears and hopefully with our hearts as well. So thank you. That was absolutely beautiful. But that's not the subject. The subject is, which means I can zero my time out and start over. I'm not going to do that. Okay. The topic is real love in an artificial intelligence world. So this is an extremely important subject for the time in which, which we live. And I'm going to tell you why. We're living in, as I said last night, unprecedented times, peculiar times, strange times, unlike any other period in human history, due to the exponential advancement of technology. That's what we're witnessing, and that's what we're experiencing. It permeates all of our lives, whether we pause to think about it or not. We are now technological creatures living in a technological culture. Uh, Elon Musk, just a couple weeks ago, began uh, to develop a whole new species that we might call cyborgs. If you were paying attention, you know that one of his four major companies is one in which he's developing um, microchips to insert in the human brain, to augment human intelligence, and to correct certain problems that people have. So the first chip was just inserted in a human brain, 
and a paraplegic we witnessed, I witnessed on video, uh, this man who cannot move his body with his mind moving the cursor on the computer and playing a game of chess with somebody somewhere else in the world. With this technology, Elon Musk will correct a large percentage of blindness in the world because the issue is not the optic nerve, but blindness in many cases is due to a brain problem that can be corrected with what, you know, Elon Musk's company Neuralink. It's just phenomenal where we are in some ways, but it is frightening where we are in other ways. Frightening, scary, like scary with a capital S, like terrifying with a capital T. That's, that's part of what's going on here. So there is something more scary than, listen to my words very carefully, there's something more scary than technology as it stands today, but the scary thing, the most scary thing of all, is being driven largely by technology. And I want to talk to you about that. So let's talk to Mr. Scary himself. So this is Stephen King. He is the uh, best-selling horror author in history. He sold something like 450 million books in multiple languages around the world. He specializes in crafting scary vocabulary. He is... He is a person who formulates sentences and paragraphs to freak people out, to scare people. So a journalist asked Stephen King, what would you say with your command of the English language? You have this massive vocabulary, and it's all about scary for you. What is the scariest word in the English language, Stephen King? And he said, alone. Alone, alone is the scariest word in the English language. And then he elaborated, yes, that's the key word, the most awful word in the English tongue. Murder doesn't hold a candle to it, and hell is only a poor synonym. For what? For alone. Alone. I want to talk to you about the loneliness epidemic that we are experiencing in our world right now. It's so out of control that in 2018, loner culture became a term that was coined and we began to speak about this as if this were a normal development among human beings. In that same year, 2018, Theresa May, who was at that time the Prime Minister of England, you may remember Theresa May, and Theresa May, noticing the situation from an empathetic standpoint, but primarily from a financial standpoint, because Great Britain was experiencing a major problem in balancing its budget due to an abnormal amount of money being spent on loneliness. And so for the first time in human history, a government appointed a minister of loneliness. I'm not making this up. There's the minister of war, the minister of finance, the minister of education, and now Great Britain has a minister of loneliness. This is a person whose whole job is to assess the loneliness epidemic, pandemic would be a more accurate word, and that loneliness that is overtaking humanity needs to be dealt with. And the research that emerged from Theresa May's appointment of Tracy Crouch as the Minister of Loneliness is that loneliness can be largely mitigated, sometimes completely cured, by human contact. Who knew? Where you could just sit with somebody and talk. And Theresa May said that uh, we think we can cure the, the problem of loneliness by pairing people up to tell their stories to one another, to just sit together and have a chat in Britain over tea, maybe high tea 
with some crumpets. But get together and do some, some talking, interact with one another. Japan followed suit and now has a minister of loneliness. Other countries will follow suit because we are experiencing a financial crisis with regards to mental health everywhere in Western culture. The number of people in the U.S. treated for depression has tripled over the last two decades. Yes, I said the word tripled over the last two decades. Antidepressants are the top-selling drugs in the United States right now. Antidepressants are. Top-selling drug. While heart disease, heart disease is the number one killer with cancer number two and stroke number three. But antidepressants, the number one class of drug being prescribed in the United States of America. I won't go into the uncomfortable realities that are present in this community at our own university right over here. What do you say here in the South? I just moved here, I'm learning this. Yonder, is it yonder? Is, is Southern Adventist University just yonder over there? Is, am I pointing the right direction? So, so, oh, okay, I don't know where it is. Okay, so, so I won't go into the uncomfortable realities of the fact that a very high percentage of young adults on that campus are on some kind of, some kind of antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications. It's unprecedented, it's not just that university, it's university age young people across the country. One in 10 Americans now take antidepressants and the number is rapidly escalating. I wanna pause right here to qualify something that is extremely important. No shame, no guilt if you are on some kind of antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication. The point of this is not to cast blame, but to take a more aerial view of the problems in culture as a whole. People I love are on antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication. I've considered it myself, because I'm kind of freaked out sometimes too. So no guilt, no shame, that's not what this is about. We're here to preach the good news of the gospel. But one in 10 Americans now are on some kind of antipsychotic medication. In one of the most remarkable books of the last 20 years, in my opinion, maybe in the last half century, this is how important this book is, the title alone is remarkable. A stroke of genius in this title, The Body Keeps the Score. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk is communicating in this book and in this title the idea that everything that happens to a human being psychologically, emotionally, makes its marks on our biology. The body, that is the physical body, keeps the score of what's going on in our heads, what's going on in our hearts. You know this intuitively when you experience something that is startling, or you almost run a red light, or somebody has a car accident near you, or something happens and you feel it, you feel it maybe here in your stomach. You have a biological, a physiological response to a psychological thought and feeling, yes? I met a guy recently who said he feels it in his shoulders. I don't know what that's about. In the stomach, generally, as human beings. But the point is that the body keeps the score. Now, Dr. Van der Kolk says, and we'll return to him in a moment, his work is groundbreaking and remarkable, that Medicaid spends more on antipsychotics than on any other class of drugs now in the United States of America. I think it was Van der Kolk who coined the term, no, I'm correcting myself right now as I speak. Prior to Van der Kolk, the term drug nation was coined, not to describe street drugs, illegal drugs, um, but the fact that most of us in America are on some kind of medication, and most of that medication, just by sheer percentage, is some form of antipsychotic. And some of us do this without a prescription, and we'll get to that later on today if you stick with us. You should stick with us. 
Um, I promise I won't waste your time. I'm using an economy of words to create and to communicate the best possible ideas for our time together. So please, if you can, attend all of these parts today. You can take a nap later. Do whatever you want with the rest of your time. Just hang out here all day. There's food available. OK, back to the point. We're in a predicament as human beings. We're in a predicament. Trauma, says van der Kolk, elaborating on the problem. Trauma, pause right there. Van der Kolk suggests, and I agreed with him before he wrote this book, as myself, uh, a sufferer of trauma, childhood trauma, uh, van der Kolk suggests that the entire human race, that planet Earth itself, is a trauma ward. That in fact, what we used to think was, you know, a, a few people, a, a small percentage of human beings, maybe those who, 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 who experienced the trauma, the, uh, the, the post-traumatic stress disorder of war, visually saw it up front, up close and personal, right? We used to think that a small percentage of human beings are traumatized. No, no, no. Van der Kolk demonstrates that we're all traumatized, more or less, to some degree. The Bible calls this sin the sin problem, which produces the psychological phenomenon of shame, which then in turn, as we're going to learn later on, produces all kinds of compensation mechanisms by which we try to mitigate the shame. We'll get to that later in greater detail. But the point now is that according to van der Kolk, trauma almost invariably, he didn't originate this idea, this goes back to uh, Genet, who was a contemporary of Freud, and he is the one, a French psychotherapist, who through observation came to the conclusion that van der Kolk is articulating here. Trauma almost invariably involves not being seen, not being mirrored, not being taken into account, not being figured in to a social circle. If nobody sees you, I don't mean physically sees you. If nobody is observant of your significance, if in fact you feel insignificant because nobody is turning their head your way to figure you in to the social dynamics, if you're not taken into account, if you're not figured in, well, trauma is accentuated. This is a primary premise of the book, The Body Keeps the Score. And what I'm suggesting to you in our time together in this, this real love and an artificial intelligence world seminar is that technology is driving people into isolation and therefore, to some significant degree, driving the loneliness pandemic. Technology is. For all its pluses, there are minuses, and therefore, as free moral agents, we need to actually be in control of it rather than it being in control of us. I'll say more about that later on. So we might even change our terminology. Social media should maybe be called, uh, if you're a teenager, don't be offended right now. If social media is what we thought we were experiencing, maybe we should call it anti-social media. I mean, let's face the fact, all your friends on Facebook aren't your friends. Now, you may have some friends in real life. Remember that? Real life? You may have some friends in real life, and they, the friends you have in real life, follow you on Facebook or Twitter, which is now X, or wherever, whatever social media platform of your choice. You may have friends in real life that follow you on social media. But all the other people... They're not your friends. Mark Zuckerberg should have come up with a different word for that. Your followers on social media are not your friends. It's a form of, it's kind of voyeurism. It's weird. It's weird that we do more life on those platforms than we do in the physical presence of actual flesh and blood human beings. I'm trying really hard to maintain self-control here. Okay, so UCLA Health, um, which is a pretty prestigious um, research magazine that is published online, 
uh, from UCLA, of course, in January of 2003, um, observed that social, since social media took off and became popular, a popular phenomena in the 2000s, in the early 2000s, watch this, the rate of adolescent depression has significantly spiked. They didn't even, I mean, the English language is pretty, I mean, it's great. 600,000 words to choose from. They didn't choose increase. They said it's spiked. Okay? And the point is this. Between 2005 and 2017, that seems like a long time ago. The numbers have changed, I'm certain. But back then, depression among young people reportedly went up by 52%? Really? Why? What's the context here? A recent book, 2024, remarkable researcher, Dr. Jonathan Haidt has informed us, and I want, I, want you to see the, I want you to see the subtitle of this book, The Anxious Generation. How the great re rewiring of childhood is causing an epidemic of mental illness. Rewiring. Now, when he says rewiring, he's not using that word in some kind of metaphoric sense. He, he's not using that word even in some kind of, uh, he's not, it's not hyperbole here. He's a scientist, and he's talking about what we call neuroplasticity. He's, he's literally saying, yes, that, 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 that neurofiring is being altered by the way we're navigating reality now, primarily for many, through screens, through social media, anti-social media. And Dr. Haight tells us that, in fact, anxiety, depression, self-harm, addiction, and suicide are spiking in our world right now, especially among children, those children whose parents actually say, you know, you're five, I think you need a iPhone now. You might want to rethink that. I mean, Cheetos were bad. Go back to Cheetos. <laughs> Give them freaking Cheetos. Why in the world? Okay, that's, again, I need to maintain self-control here, but the book is informing us that anxiety, depression, self-harm, addiction, and suicide, suicidal ideation, more accurately, boom, spiking right now right now in Western culture. But what's God's approach? That's enough bad news. We're here to talk about the good news. Happy Sabbath. Okay, so <laughs> what's God's approach to all of this? Here's what I want to suggest to you regarding God's approach. Check this out. In one of the most remarkable lines in all of Scripture, Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, the Son of Man you know, that's one of the titles for Jesus. That's how he refers to himself, right? The Son of Man came, came, a little bit of travel has occurred, came from where to where? Came from whatever the heavenly realm is, probably not somewhere up, it's probably an overlapping phenomenon of some kind, but whatever. The Son of Man came from heaven, let's say, to earth. That's what he means by came. He came. This is what we call the incarnation. God became human. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. Was he hungry? Was he thirsty? Could he not have generated food and drink for himself in that heavenly realm? Is the point here caloric intake? No, the point is not caloric intake. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. God came to our world to save us by eating and drinking with us. You have to understand that in ancient cultures, most ancient cultures, especially, and for certain, ancient Near Eastern culture where Jesus was born and was living out these realities, that in ancient culture, mealtime was primarily a social event. Now, we invented in the West, I don't know, did we invent these in the United States, what we call the kitchen counter? You know you do it. You stand there with no one, all by yourself, scarfing stuff down. 
and you call that a meal. Biblically speaking, that's inaccurate. That is not a meal. I did it yesterday. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm simply saying that things are different now, and not different in a good way, okay? It used to be that it was very common for people to have breakfast together as a family, have lunch together as a family, have dinner together as a family, things like that, maybe at least once a day, might occur in the average home. Now we're just like scraping with our arm food off the counter and opening our mouth and just shoving it in. What's wrong with us? Sorry. Okay, so in biblical times, the meal was a social phenomenon. When it says the Son of Man, God in the flesh, came eating and drinking, he came to socialize with us. He came to hang out in the vernacular. He came to spend time with us. I like this kind of God. I mean, think about this. The God of the universe, with all his omnipotence and omniscience, looked down upon the world and said, they're in trouble. They're broken. They're dysfunctional. They're rebellious. They're sinners. They're full of shame and guilt, and it causes them to not be able to have eye contact very easily with one another anymore. Their eyes are shifting. Their posture is weird. They don't know how to interact anymore. They're all so guilty. What shall I do? How shall I save them? Shall I paint words across the sky? What will I do? Oh, I know. I'll go hang out with them. I'll go socialize them out of their shame into innocence. I'll go become their friend, and I'll let them get comfortable in my presence, and then I'll lean over and say, Psst, by the way, I'm God. What? <laughs> you're God? And you're hanging out with me? Aren't you mad at me? Don't you hate me? Aren't you angry? You want to be with me? Yeah, I want to be with you. But, but I'm messed up. Noted. <laughs> you think I haven't noticed? I'm not oblivious <laughs> to your dysfunction. Messed up is an understatement, he might say, in his mind, but not out loud. <laughs> right? God came to save us by eating and drinking with us. But let's finish the passage, shall we? The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. They, the they here, they say, these are the religious leaders. These are people like, like your pastor and the elders. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> these, are, these are the Pharisees back then. Right? And they meant this as an insult. Look at him. Befriending tax collectors and sinners. Look at him eating and drinking with them. What? Check this out. But wisdom, the gospel author here, comments, wisdom is justified by her children. Another version renders it this way. But wisdom is shown to be right by its results. And what were its results? What were the results of God in the flesh, Jesus, the Son of Man, pulling up a seat to our table, saying, hey, pass the baba ganoush. That's some good hummus. A little more of that down at this end of the table. What was the result of Jesus hanging out with people socially that you weren't supposed to hang out with socially? What was the result? Well, the results were is that they fell in like with him. And that was the precursor to falling in love with him. And that changed the trajectory not only of their lives, but of all human history. We're here this morning because God came eating and drinking. In Chasing the Scream, 
one of the most groundbreaking books of recent times on addiction. Right? Johann Hari broke new ground. He uttered a single sentence in this book. Actually, he uttered the sentence first on a TED Talk. Then he wrote it in a book. Because if your TED Talk goes really good, you write a book. So he wrote a book, and he uttered a single sentence that completely reframed addiction. Right? Here's the sentence. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety. It's connection. Just, would you just meditate on that for a moment? Do you have an addict in your life? It is an absolute certainty that you do. There are addicts in this room. Most of us are addicted to something. Maybe not alcohol or chemical compounds, but there are other things that we'll talk about later on today that we're addicted to. Sneak preview, including religion. Religion is the best place in the world to hide from God if it's not immersed in the gospel. If it's formal and ritualistic and condemnatory and miserly with compassion, it's a really good place to hide from God. So the opposite of addiction, according to Hari, is not sobriety, it's connection. He goes on, if you are alone, you cannot escape addiction. It's just not going to happen. If you are loved, you have a chance. Are you beginning to see the vital necessity of the church, of the living God? Because what is the church? The church is a social network of people who do life in proximity to one another so that they can be, we can be, all of us can be seen and taken into account and helped and loved through our dysfunctions. The worst thing, absolute worst thing that can happen to a local church is to develop a culture of condemnation, nitpicking, policing everybody's behaviors, wondering why she dot, 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 how could he dot, dot, dot. Well, here's the question whenever you say to yourself, how could he do such a thing? Here's the question. Here's the question. What makes you think you wouldn't do exactly the same thing given the same circumstances, pressures, and genetics? You are not fundamentally better than anybody who've ever done anything. You would do the same thing. In fact, you are doing the same thing in principle. And you're doing worse with your cocky little religious attitude. That's the thing Jesus really is trying to cure most of us from. So what is the wisdom of Jesus? Wisdom is proven true and right by its results. Well, what's, what's going on here? Jesus, the wisdom of Jesus is that he saved people during his time, and he's trying to do it now through his people. Jesus saved people from their sin and shame by becoming their friend in spite of their sin and shame. Is sin and shame present? Yes. Should friendship supersede it? Yes. Or else we're not the church of Christ. We're something, call it something, maybe call it paganism with a Christian mask. But it's not the good news. It's not the gospel. Is there sin and shame present in people's lives? Yes. Should friendship supersede it? Yes. We know this because the Son of Man came eating and drinking. He came to befriend us. He said it point blank, or as they say, straight up. Just put it on the table. No longer do I call you servants. For a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things 
that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. John 15, 15. What's happening here? Jesus is drawing a contrast that we'll talk about in greater detail later today. Jesus is drawing a contrast here between two kinds of relational dynamics. There is the servant-master relational dynamic, right? Is that present? You see that in the text? And then there's the friendship dynamic. Do you see that in the text? And Jesus is saying, not that, this. And he's God. If anybody is in a position to relate to us as inferiors, as servants, you know, God could very easily say, I'm God, you're not, basic arrangement. You do what I say or else. And we'd all comply to save our hides. But the question would remain, does anybody, does anybody love God? Because love and coercion can't occupy the same emotional space simultaneously. So the, the point is that Jesus says, I don't want a relational dynamic with you that is governed by fear, manipulation, coercion. I'm, I'm not going to put my thumb on your shame. I'm not going to rub your nose. In it. I'm not going to make you do what I want you to do by making you feel bad or obligated. No, I'm going to love you. I'm going to be your friend. And then in the context of my friendship, and this is the part we don't like about it, this is long game. Condemnation is short game. And we as a church have been playing short game relational dynamics for so long that our churches are empty of young adults largely. I won't go into the numbers, but the numbers are frightening. We've been playing short game relational dynamics expecting that if you call their attention to whatever it is that you or I think they're doing wrong and ought to be rectified, they're going to naturally lean out until they vanish. But if you play long game relational dynamics and you just keep on, how shall we say this, being nice, being kind, waiting, holding your tongue, loving, passing the Baba Ganoush, keeping them close so they can go through their junk with us rather than without us? I mean, what kind of insanity is this? That we're Expecting them to do better outside of our influence? So we play the short game of shame rather than the long game of love. No longer do I call you my servants. I want you to be my friends. I'm not going to relate to you in a way that will drive you from me. I'm going to relate to you in a way that will keep us in close contact. Do you have some issues? That's an understatement. Are you messed up? Mm-hmm. I still love you. Stay with me. Stay with me. So the traditional model, I'm not sure traditional is the right word for that, but the traditional model is the way we approach people is you need to believe the right things. You need to be doctrinally correct. And you need to behave correctly. Then we're paying attention, too. We've got forms and stuff. You need to believe the right things, you need to behave the right way, and then the nonverbal cues will make clear to you whether you belong or not. And some of us are so verbal, there will be verbal cues. You know what I'm talking about. Jesus flipped that relational trajectory, and it looked something like this. He just showed up at the table. He just hung out 
with people who are doing all the wrong stuff. I mean, bro, we can't even handle nail polish. And Jesus is hanging out with people who are doing some pretty dastardly stuff, right? And he, he communicates in his nonverbal interactions by just socializing with them. He communicates, I like you. I love you. I'm here with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. And then here's what happens. This is, this is, I mean, this is human psychology 101. I don't know how we missed this. It's very easy to observe that we are creatures that are malleable. We're very easily influenced. That's why everybody in this room looks approximately the same. We're all wearing skinny ties now rather than fat ties, unless you're 84 and you got stuck in a time warp, which kudos to you, you should have. That means you're a little more original than the rest of us, praise God. But the point is that we're very influenced by everyone around us. You know, haircuts come and go, you know, skinny ties, fat ties, V-necks, not V-necks. If you're going to be aware of V-neck, by the way, you should remove the hair. <laughs> it's a totally different subject. But the, the point is this. The point is this. I hope you're still tracking with me. That was an accident. I didn't mean to say that. Okay. So, <laughs> so Jesus flipped it in a different direction. He said, he said, listen, listen, listen. You belong to me. You are my son. You are my daughter. You know how this works. You have some family members, don't you? Here comes Thanksgiving, here comes Christmas. You're like, oh, no. But he's family. He belongs to us. <laughs> right? Jesus, Jesus said, you belong to me. You're my son, you're my daughter. I'm with you, right? And what happens, we're, is this a word, influenceable? Somebody Google that for me. And we begin to believe like the people we love and respect, which is to say we begin to believe like those who love and respect us. And then we begin to behave in better ways. And we let the Holy Spirit work that out with a person because some of us have weird little idiosyncrasies in our standards that we made up and we think there are Bible verses for these things. But the point is that whatever God wants to correct in a person, if we keep on allowing them to belong, they will begin to believe. They will begin to behave. Maybe not exactly the way you think they ought to behave, but they'll begin to behave the way Jesus wants them to behave. Ellen White says it this way, for those of you who are familiar with this author, our influence upon others depends not so much upon what we say as what we are. Men may combat our, and defy our logic. They may resist our appeals. But a life of disinterested love is an argument they cannot gainsay. This was written, written like a hundred and some years ago. Disinterested means something like love that doesn't have an agenda. Right? And gainsay means something like you can't deny it or defy it. You can argue with someone's apologetics, their arguments, their doctrinal arguments. You can't, if somebody loves you, you're like, whoa. What am, I say, what am I gonna say to that? What am I gonna say to that? You don't love me? I can't know that. All I can do is assess the way you're relating to me. Love is the only irrefutable evidence Christianity has to offer. Now, that's not to say there aren't doctrinal verities. There are. But those doctrinal truths, right, they're going to come along as people belong. That was poetic. <laughs> that was totally accidental. Okay. They're going to come along as people belong, right? That which was from the beginning, John says, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon with and handled with our hands. Are you tracking with him? He's telling us what he experienced with Jesus. Watch this. Concerning the word of life, the life, 
He calls Jesus the life. Not the teaching, the doctrine, the standard. The life. There are doctrines, there are teachings, there are standards. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Concerning the word of life, the life was manifested. And we have seen it, and we bear witness, and we declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which what we have seen and heard, and we declare to you that you may have, you also may have fellowship with us. Watch this. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you so that your joy may be full. Fellowship is koinonia here in the Greek, and it means something like community, communion, participation, doing life with others, doing life together. John says, we're inviting you into doing life with us. We got your back. We're here for you. Why? Because that's what we experienced with Jesus. That's how he was with us. And that's how we will be with you. Joy here is a Greek word that means to feel delight, to be happy, to experience pleasure, to feel emotionally up and alive. Fellowship makes us feel up and alive. Joy. Psychological, emotional joy. Brene Brown, who's totally hitting home runs in everything she's writing right now. If you ask me the one thing I know for sure after 200,000 pieces of data, you think you read? I know that in the absence of love and belonging, there is always suffering. That I know for sure. Circles are better than rows. Rows are fine when we're doing something like this. We're preaching, we're teaching. But friendship is more powerful than preaching. The best preachers are, are not the best preachers. The best preachers are the preachers that sit in circles with people, that sit at tables with people, that hang out with people, that spend time with people. Articulation from a stage, that's not the thing. I mean, we need to do it because things need to be articulated and explained. But that's a lesser part of ministry. The larger part of ministry is koinonia, fellowship, communion, doing life together. Thanks for your time. That took 46 minutes. You